would like to acknowledge the presence of national artist for music, Ms. Fides Cuyugan Asensio. The School of Humanities of the Ateneo de Manila University, in cooperation with the Societa Dante Alighieri Comisiato de Manila, and through the support of Juan Laurel Fund in the Humanities, present Puccini Antipasti, a lecture performance in anticipation of the centenary of Giacomo Puccini. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Ateneo de Manila University, Father Roberto Yap. It's a little dark, so I hope I can read. <laughs> His Excellency Ambassador Marco Clemente, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to the Ateneo de Manila University. One of the priority areas of the university is the bridging of cultural divides. In an increasingly divided world, it is more urgent that we try to understand those from whom we differ and find common ground. In that mission, the arts and the study of the arts certainly has a role to play. Some of you who are old enough might still remember the final scene of the mission, a movie dramatizing how the rivalry between the Portuguese and the Spanish eventually led to the destruction of a Jesuit mission, the reductions in Paraguay. It was through music that Father Gabriel was able to bring the Guarini Indians into the faith and after that massacre at the mission, the final scene shows that it is the oboe that the surviving Guarini picked up. This afternoon event is perhaps less about bridging cultural divides than strengthening bridges through music. Our artists are all from the University of the Philippines, our esteemed neighbor in Katipunan. This lecture performance also coincides with the celebration of Italian Language Week amplifying our students' exposure to the culture and language of Italy. Some of you might still recall the concert of orchestral music from Verdi a few months ago, also held here at the Arete to celebrate the 75th year of establishing diplomatic relations between Italy and the Philippines. Puccini Antipasti is a more modest affair. As the title suggests, it offers bite-sized portions of Puccini on the eve of his centenary next year. It hopes to stimulate the appetite of both those who have not been acquainted with opera, a small divide is being bridged there, and those who already have a taste for it. In preparation for the main course, if all goes well, which is the staging of Puccini's short operas here at the Arete in this university in March 2024. We are very hopeful, Ambassador under the auspices of the Italian Embassy. We can also, one can also expect a series of events leading up to the operas to be organized by the School of Humanities. The School of Humanities also organized this afternoon's event in cooperation with Societa Dante Alighieri Cornitato de Manila with the generous support of the Juan Laurel family. Well then, let us begin. Enjoy the lecture performance and good afternoon to everyone. May we invite the Ambassador of Italy to the Philippines, Ambassador Marco Clemente, to say a few words. It's interesting that uh, in this country, uh, when they invite you to speak, they always emphasize a few words because <laughs> they're worried that that the speech will be they will be uh, too long. And in this case, they are right in uh, in worrying that because I am very tempted to be very long today uh, for many reasons. Mr. President, uh, thank you again for for your hospitality. Uh, and it's always a 
very nice for me to be here. I, 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 I told you that I consider Ateneo my uh, another home. I won't, I wouldn't put it in a, in the ranking list, but definitely is, is one of my favorite uh, place in in Manila. Uh, and I remember visiting it during the COVID, and it was desert, and it was so sad to see this beautiful place without people. Now the situation is very different. Uh, as the president mentioned, our cooperation has developed in the, in the recent years. We had uh, this, uh, this concert, which started actually this cooperation also in the musical term. I have to correct you. It was not only under the auspices. Uh, uh, sorry, we talk about next year. No, no, sorry. We had the Verdi concert, but of course next year we, we, we hopefully uh, there is a fundraising uh, process uh, ongoing, and it's always very complicated, as you know that, especially for these kind of cultural events. But let's be positive. I'm sure it will happen, and it won't be only under the auspices of the of the embassy, but also with the financial support of the embassy. And uh, and of course, uh, we are more than happy that this is the case. Um, why there there is the risk for me to be long tonight? First of all, because I like this place. So I, I like to express my love for for, for this uh, this uh, Ateneo, this university. And, and, and of course, there is an important uh, an important presence of, of an important institution dealing with Italian culture, which is the, the Società Dante Alighieri. And of course, it uh, gives me uh, much pleasure to see that the Dante Alighieri Society is back on its feet after, after some years of difficulties for, for, of course, connected to the COVID. And, but now it's back in the picture. That's uh, very good news. And, but most importantly, because today we are celebrating Giacomo Puccini. Um, I really urge you, I don't know if tonight we have connoisseur or newcomers. Can I ask you to raise your hands? Who considers yourself an opera lover and an opera connoisseur? Mm. So most of you are definitely newcomers. Uh, more, more interesting because, of course, a concert like this is there is not much. I mean, it's useful for those who already know, but it's even more important for those who never heard uh, opera. Um, and I really, I really commend this this initiative. Um, Puccini is a victim of, of his uh, of his uh, popularity. He's probably the most performed composer of in the, I think, the overall repertoire. He composed only 12 operas, and I think nine of them are permanently part of the, of the standard repertoire. If you make the same comparison with important uh, composers such as Verdi or, or Wagner, well, Ma Wagner maybe is the one who's really more closer to Puccini. But Verdi composed 28 operas, but only half of them are permanently in the repertoire. Not to consider other Italian composers, Rossini, Donizetti. They, they, at, that, at that time, they, you know, the, the, the composer composed a lot. But Mascagni, Mignon Cavallo, all, all, all Puccini's, uh, let's say, the composer who, who lived more or less at the same time. But with Puccini, it's really, it's a almost unique situation. Almost all of his opera are very, very frequently performed. But why I said it's a victim of his popularity? Because, because it's popular, people think it's an easy composer. Because it's melodic, they say it's an easy uh, composer. And you cannot imagine uh, how many criticism Puccini has earned during his career, but also after his death. I really urge you, especially those who don't know Puccini, not to be led astray by this. Tonight we are listening to beautiful areas, but there is so much more. 
than areas. I really recommend you to, if we live in Europe, we would say to go and see the real thing. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, there are not very many opportunities to do it. We will, we will be trying to offer that opportunity uh, next year. And uh, there was a, an, a, another opportunity last year in December uh, for the Turandot performance. Is it mine? No. And sorry, is it mine? No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so we will give this opportunity, but they were very rare. But don't be. Uh, I mean, don't don't take it as a, as an excuse to to know more, because now technology allows. Just open your YouTube, uh, and you'll find everything you want to, to, to watch and listen to. So really, I hope that this concert is only the first ap ap aperitivo, uh, antipasto, sorry, for, for knowing more. Puccini deserves that, deserves that, because he's probably one of the most sophisticated um, uh, composer in the, in the 20th century or end of 19th century. Stravinsky used to have Puccini's scores on, on his shelf. Uh, Ravel, and they all consider Puccini a great master of orchestration, and, but because he was so uh, good at writing beautiful melodies, and, and he had a very, very good the theatrical uh, uh, sense what makes the difference between Puccini theater and the other composer, but because Puccini knew how to choose the right plot. Because other composer, maybe they wrote very beautiful music, but they were not as good as Puccini in choosing the right uh, uh, subject. Uh, and this is, don't forget that opera is music and uh, drama. So it's musical theater. That is why this cannot be, can be only a antipasto. But the main course you have to, to enjoy. Otherwise, you'll miss the whole thing. So let's hope that this is an antipasto for a lot to come. And in this, of course, uh, next year we will celebrate the centennial of, of Puccini's death. Uh, we will do with Ateneo this, hopefully, this, this production. But I uh, uh, clearly demanded uh, to the organizer of this uh, production that there will be two, two performances of this double bill um, to to uh, include this performance in a all week, week of Puccini. And this week must be the starting point of a better knowledge of Puccini in this country. How? In this, the universities are crucial. We have to uh, take a more scientific musicologist approach. So we have to raise the level of Puccini awareness, inviting musicologists, artists to talk about Puccini, but in a more academic uh, way. It sounds boring, but it, it, it won't be, I promise you. It's so fun to talk opera, but let's do it seriously in a way that's really increase the interest. Opera is so dense, it's so complex, that the more you know it, the more you enjoy it. And, uh, and this is something that the only, universe, all, only the academia can do, really. I, I, I really believe that in this Puccini week, we should see the combination of efforts of all the university in Manila to organize seminars, uh, awareness courses for children. For, for, it, it must be a, a full week of events. This, is, this will be the best way to celebrate Puccini. Because single concerts, single opera performances, especially in a country where 
the knowledge of opera is not as developed as, uh, as Europe or Northern America, uh, but some, uh, some Asian countries also, I must say, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, even China, they, they, there is more opera there. And this is one regret that the ball has had. I hope that next year with these joint efforts, we can really turn the page also in this country because, I mean, the Philippines must be the, the, the driving force. I mean, your history is so much connected to, to European culture that it's a, it's a pity that you don't see much more uh, opera. I mean, I'm particularly interested in that, but or the classical music for that matter. So let's hope that next year's celebration will leave um, uh, a, a, a seed which will grow in, into something more, more important. I assure you, and I'm so glad that I'm talking to people that most, most of them, you don't know much about opera. People, uh, Puccini really deserved that. And, um, and, and next year, a celebration will be remembered as a turning point in this, in this endeavor. So thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy the concert. Congratulations for those who are instrumental in organizing it. Thank you. Can you turn on that? Dorma. Uh, that's what we heard from the movie clips that we just saw um, from Giacomo Puccini's opera Turandot. Good afternoon. I am Rika Nepomuceno, and uh, we will, I will be giving you an overview, just a quick overview, uh, an introduction to Puccini's music. Uh, well, that opera, Turandot, was unfortunately, unfortunately left unfinished. No, he passed away before he finished it. And, um, but his music has been used over 300 times, in over 300 films. You know, um, and uh, even during the era of silent movies, arrangements of his music have been used. Um, arrangement of the music of this man. I'm kidding, that's Albert Einstein. <laughs> he looks like Puccini, right? This is Puccini. Uh, Giacomo Puccini. Giacomo Antonio Domenico Michele Secondo Maria. Puccini, that's how long his name is. No, um, well, Giacomo Puccini for short. Oops. 
He was born in Lucca on December 22, 1858. Now, where is Lucca? Lucca is there, near Firenze, there. Um, as you can see, the map is from of Italy in 1848, 1848, 10 years before Puccini was born. Now, he was born at the height of the Italian Risorgimento. What is the Risorgimento? You know, I've, you know talking about Italian history in front of the ambassador is a little bit challenging, don't you think? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Risorgimento, it was an ideological and literary movement of unification in the 19th century that helped arouse the national consciousness of the Italian people, and it culminated in the establishment of the Kingdom of Italy in 1861. Again, in 1861, three years after Puccini was born. Risorgimento was a complex political process of, of diplomatic and military events and social and economic transformations. Did I say that correctly, Ambassador? <laughs> okay, in modern day Italy, this Luca is here between Florence and Pisa, somewhere there, there. Luca is there. Here. Oops. You see Florence, you see Pisa, there's Luca. Luca. Okay. Puccini was born in a family of musicians. No. Four generations of uh, of local, local musicians, of church organists at the cathedral of, Luca Cathedral of St. Martin. Imagine four generations. Now, from his great-great-grandfather in, in the 1700s up to his father in the 1800s. So he was supposed to be the fifth generation. And um, he studied at the seminary uh, school in Luca. Uh, he, he sang as a boy soprano until his, boy, his voice changed. Now, in 1874, he entered, at, uh, he entered the music institution of Luca, Institute of Music, and the locals, of course, the locals, of course, were expecting him to carry on the family tradition of being a church organist, but the following year, in, 18, in, in 1874, uh, in 1875, a year after he entered the Music Institute, at 17 years old, he walked all the way to Pisa from Lucca, which is probably, I don't know, four hours of trek, four hours of trekking, to watch Verdi's Aida. And there he was so inspired, he was so overwhelmed by the music that he decided not to follow the family tradition not to follow the footsteps of his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather before him. And he decided, from then on, he decided to be an opera composer. Um, fortunately, when he graduated from the Music Institute in 1879, he was, oh, in 1880, he was awarded an, a scholarship by Queen Margaret of Savoy to the Milan Conser Conservatory. Mm. Oh, this is Messa di Gloria. Messa di Gloria was his, uh, was his final project at the Music Institute. He was 19 years old, probably, when he composed this. And then in 1880, he was awarded uh, uh, a scholarship by, the, by Queen Margaret. Um, and uh, yeah, at the Milan Conservatory, he studied first, he studied with Antonio Bazzini, violinist and composer, and Amilcare Ponchielli. Amilcare Ponchielli was already a well-known composer at that time. So, uh, yeah, he, Puccini very much wanted to learn the coup de théâtre 
or the, the, the plot twists of drama. So from there, he was already very, very interested on staging, on, on, on the drama of the theater. And uh, for his final project, he composed a Capriccio Sinfonico. It's purely orchestral music, but he was very much praised, highly praised by his teachers when he composed that. So um, remember that later, Capriccio Sinfonico, because we will go back to that. We will go back to that. Now, in Milan, he met Arrigo Boito, Emilio Praga, and other Bohemian artists, the Scapigliati. Scapigliatura was a mid-19th century avant-garde literary and cultural movement, which flourished especially in Milan and Turin. The Scapigliati were followers of French Romanticism. They were followers of, uh, of French Romanticism. They had a particular taste for the eccentric, for the sinister, for the grotesque. And um, they, they wanted to incur, incorporate everyday speech into, the, in, into their literary language. They emphasized the need for non-courtly literature. You know, before that, before that, you know, the, the, the stories, the drama and the operas were all about kings and queens, you know, stories of the court. And this, this Capigliati, they, they preferred, they wanted something not a story, not stories, not of, of, the, of the court, not of kings, not of queen, queens. And um, this, the Scapigliati were very much inter interested in music. Some of them were, in fact, um, opera librettists like Arrigo Boito. Now, um, Federico Fontana, uh, Ferdinando Fontana, a scapigliato, uh, wrote the libretto of Puccini's first two operas, Le Villi and Edgar. Both operas were set in Nordic islands and present murky love stories that end tragically. Now, Le Villi, uh, Puccini's first opera, um, he entered it in the Sonsogno competition. Sonsogno uh, is a um, publishing house. Now, he, at that time, the publishing houses were very influential in the, in the production of operas, in the composition and production of operas. Now, Sonsogno held a competition, and Puccini entered his, his first opera in the competition, but it did not win. Now, what happened was the rival uh, publishing house, the Ricordi Publishing House, published, uh, published the, the opera, and they produced it, and uh, it was a success. It was relatively a success. It premiered on December 26, 1884, at Teatro Reggio in Turin. Now, his second opera, Edgar, premiered on uh, April 21, 1889 at the Teatro alla Scala in Milan and was the only unsuccessful opera, relatively unsuccessful opera of Puccini. But after Edgar, Puccini decided that he will choose his subjects himself and he prescribed the dramatic style of the libretto before setting them to music. Now, in 1893, at the age of 34, it took him a long time to uh, produce, uh, to write another opera. In 1893, at the age of 34, Manon Lesco. Four librettists plus the, the publisher himself, Giulio Ricordi, worked on the libretto. But for some reason, Puccini wasn't so convinced. He found weak points. And um, librettist Luigi Illica took over. And he strengthened parts of, of the libretto that Puccini found weak. Now, it premiered on Feb 1 in 1893 at the Teatro Reggio in, in Turin. 
It is based on Abi Prevost's novel of the same title, Manon Lesko, and it is the story of a young gentleman's fatal passion for a fascinating amoral woman, and it was his first successful opera. In its premiere in London, George Bernard Shaw said, proclaimed, we have found a, a successor to Verdi. So even, even Giulio Ricordi recognized that. They found a successor to Verdi, who was the greatest composer, uh, especially of the 19th century. Um, Mom Lucy, hi. Lucy Magalit, pianist, um, should... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Now, um, we re because Puccini, Puccini had um, integrated just integrated the Wagnerian style, sort of Wagnerian style of orchestration, but without renouncing the traditional Italian lyrical melody. Um, we'll just listen to, to the last page of Gris Aria, Donna non vidi mai. Okay, so we heard just a, a colorful, a, a colorful accompaniment, or orchestral line, but the melody is still very Italian. Now, now if Manon Lesco was a success, his fourth opera, La Boheme, was an even greater success, and it gained Puccini international recognition. It premiered on February. We won at 1896 at the Teatro Reggio in Turin under the baton of the legendary conductor Arturo Toscanini. Um, the story is based uh, from the scenes of Saint de la Vie Bobem, Scenes of Bohemian Life by Henri Mugea. It is a series of um, narratives, series of stories, short narratives, that appeared in the Le Corsair, it's a magazine, about poor people in Paris between 1830 to 1840. To a libretto by Luigi Illica and Giuseppe Giacosa. These two librettists were very, very close, well, they had mutual respect for each other. That's why they're, um, the two of them, plus Puccini, and with Ricordi, with, with Ricordi looking over them, they had a very, very successful operas. Um, now, La Boheme is a story of a young seamstress, Mimi, her love for the young poet Rodolfo, set in Paris in, uh, in the world of bohemian artists. Now, the opera, more than the original series, has since become the model or the idea of bohemian life. Um, the Broadway musical, Rent, are you familiar with it? Is based on, on Puccini's La Boheme. Um, Puccini used materials from his earlier works and integrated them into, into his operas. Um, for example, he based, remember the Capriccio Sinfonico, his graduation project in Milan? He used the second movement, part of the second movement of that. This is the Capriccio Sinfonico.
That's his Capriccio Sinfonico. And let's listen to the opening uh, bars, uh, opening part of La Boheme. Marroso mi abolisha sidera. Come se addosso mi piovesse in stile. Per vendicarmi a fuoco un faraò. So, yeah, he used, it was the first part, the first, probably the first page was verbatim. No? And then he elaborated on it. Um, now, in the early 90s, Rolando Tino, national artist uh, for music, Rolando, uh, for literature, sorry, uh, Rolando Tino adapted and translated the Italian libretto to Filipino. Um, let me just read a few lines of his um, translation. This is from Si mi chiama no mi mi. Si mi chiama no mi mi. Uh, il mio nome è Lucia. Uh, yes, they call me Mimi, but my name is Lucia. Oh, oh, palayo ko i Mimi. Ang pangalan ko ay Lucia. La storia mia è breve, a tela o a seta ricamo in casa e fuori. Um, my, my, my story is short. Um, I, uh, what do you call this? I embroider, I embroider at home um, fake, uh, fake flowers. Simple ang aking buhay, trabajo y buburda ng seda. Son tranquilla e lieta ed è mio, sva ed è mio svago far giglie rose. Uh, I am calm and happy, and my happiness is to make, uh, to make lilies and roses. Lalong kay ligaya kapag ginagawa, ginagawa ay lirio at rosas. Mm. Lubhang haring nawiwili sa lahat ng... Sorry. Sa lahat ng... Ligaya, tulad ng pagliyag na bagong silang. O tulad ng pangarap at haraya, basta't bagay na, basta't bagay na may badyang damdamin. Maliwanag. Ma'am Lucy, can I hear um, third system? Lubhang haring? Lubhang haring na wibili? Third system of page 70? Si Mikyama, no? At the CCP, uh, Ignacio Jimenez Black Box, the Cultural Center of the Philippines and Viva Voce Laboratory, Viva Voce Lab, uh, will be doing Labo on November 9 to 12, 9, 10, 11, 12, 
yeah, the CCP block box. So uh, we hope you can watch. It's good. it's gonna be fun. We have to advise you that it's highlight, not the full opera. Ah, uh, yeah, it's uh, highlights of the the opera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so please watch. Um, the next opera, his fifth opera, um, Tosca, premiered on January 14, 1900 at the Teatro Costanzi in Rome. Um, now, sex, brutality, sadism, and religion are the ingredients of this opera. In terms of theme, Tosca adheres to the requirements of Verismo. Now, Puccini is one of the composers of Verismo opera. What is Verismo? Verismo is, means realism. No, it's a move, it was a movement between the 19th, it flourished between the 19th and the 20th century. Now, the musician exponents of Verismo, uh, of this genre, are, uh, you have Pietro Mascagni, um, Ruggero Leon Cavallo, Umberto Giordano, and, uh, oops, sorry. It's not working. Oops. Francesco Cilea. Um, yeah. Speaking of Verismo, it was. Uh, I would also like to invite you to watch a double bill of Verismo operas in November 10 and 12 at the St. Scholastica's College. Uh, the Lyric Opera of the Philippines in cooperation with the um, Hong Kong Lyric Opera are presenting um, uh, Cavalleria Rusticana by Pietro Mascagni and I Pagliacci by Ruggero Leon Cavallo. So again, November 10 at 7 p.m. and November 12 at 3 p.m. I hope you can watch. Anyway, back to the Verismo style. Now, what, what is the style of the Verismo? Now, emphatic vocal, uh, vocality, leaning towards the middle range to the higher range, the, the tessitura, the, the, the range of the voice. But the inflections were very, very close to the spoken language. No, uh, with, but without giving up the moments of lyrical singing. They, were com they are simple and concrete language of everyday life um, with inflections and rhythms and movements of spoken language. No, but it does not mean that they um, rejected or they gave up on, uh, on the traditional metrical forms especially in the moments of, 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 in the lull of action. Now, structure, the structure of versification was modified. It was polymetric. It wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't anymore the, you know, counting the syllables of seven, the partnership of seven, seven syllables and four syllables in one verse. You know, to complete an, an 11, to il complete an 11 syllable uh, line. Because uh, before the two centuries, in the last two centuries, the endica syllable or the 11 syllable line verse was the perfect, um, perfect verse for them. So a combination of seven and four or eight and five. But the verismo, they veered away from that. They veered away from that. So um, polymetric text, which was devoid of any form of regularity, was, uh, was done. Um, an example of that you will hear la later uh, when Mom Camille Lopez uh, will do Visidarte from Puccini's Tosca. Um, and also in La Boheme, the, the, the previous, the th fourth opera, it was, it's impossible to identify uh, closed metrical forms. Now, in terms of theme, 
very small is about tragic passion, you know, con in, set in contemporary rural, rural setting. And they, the characters are usual, are, are um, ordinary people, not, not of the high courts, not noblemen, but peasants and plebeians and sub proletarians. Now the plots are daring, audacious, and full of bloodshed. There's always a bloodshed. And it's full of jealousy and violence and overwhelming sentiments. But uh, rather, than, uh, rather than showing the true, uh, true life, what happens in true life, Verismo in music actually pretends that what happens on stage happens in real life. Now, uh, what matters is that the audience uh, are, can recognize and identify with the sentiments, with the feeling. Um, and Puccini did that, and his librettos were about bringing about the feelings and familiar images and familiar feelings of everyday life of the ordinary people instead of, um, of fantastic dreams. Okay. And um, Tosca, actually, in terms of characters, they do not belong to the lower, lower classes. The realism is found, again, in the passion, extreme passion, uh, overwhelming passion, and also the violence um, uh, in terms of verismo. And the realism is found in its connection with history. Uh, it is set. Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, actually after the French Revolution, um, and it was a time of political unrest. The realism in Tosca lies in that. Now, Tosca was set in Rome in mid June 1800, in the years shortly after the French Revolution. The story revolves around the opera singer Tosca and her attempt to save her lover, the painter Cavaradossi, from the hands of the saddest police chief, corrupt police chief, Baron Scarpia. Now, it is taken from um, the drama of the same title, Tosca, by Victorien Sardou, and libretto by, again, Illica and Giacosa. So they really worked well together. The action takes place um, in less than 24 hours. So from the start of the opera to the end of the opera, the, 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 the time frame is less than 24 hours from between noon, between noon of June 18, 1800, and the dawn of the following day. And they happen, the setting happen on specific locations in Rome. The Church of San, uh, Sant'Andrea della Valle, first act, and then the apartments of Palazzo Farnese, and the Castel Sant'Angelo. Now, the plot centers um, around the three main characters. Uh, the opera singer Tosca, the painter and republican, Mario Cavaradossi, and the corrupt chief of police, Baron Scarpia. Why does um, <laughs> corrupt chief of police sounds very familiar? <laughs> uh, anyway, Baron Scarpia was, has been lusting for Tosca for like the longest time. And when Scarpia suspects that Cavaradossi, the boyfriend of Tosca, was helping an escaped political prisoner, he takes this opportunity to catch the prisoner and to get Cavaradossi out of the way so he can have Tosca all to himself. Now, Cavaradossi is arrested and Scarpia violently tortures him and he manipulates Tosca into revealing the, the escaped prisoner's hiding place and thus implicating Cavaradossi as well. So Cavaradossi is then sentenced to death by execution. And Scarpia bargains with Tosca. He says, either you give yourself to me or your lover dies. 
Now, she agrees to satisfy Scarpia's lust, and Scarpia issues a command to the firing squad to use blank bullets instead, because he's going to have Tosca, so Cavaradossi is not going to die anymore. So they're going to use uh, fake bullets. And then when Scarpia comes over to embrace Tosca, Tosca stabs him on the chest with a knife that she took from Scarpia's dining table. And then, so Scarpia dies. At dawn, um, Tosca rushes to the Castel Sant'Angelo, where Cavaradossi's fake execution was going to happen. She tells him that it will be a fake execution. And they look forward, they say, and they look forward to their freedom. The firing squad arrives, and Tosca watches, but she realizes that the execution was real. Now, Cavaradossi dies, and Scarpia's police, police assistant rushes in to arrest Tosca for, because she killed Scarpia. But Tosca climbs on the battlements of the Castel Sant'Angelo Sant and jumps to her death. Tragic, yeah? Bloody and tragic. Anyway, um, yeah. Madama Butterfly, Sly, uh, that's her sixth opera. Madama Butterfly premiered on Feb 7, 17, 1904 at La Scala, Teatro alla Scala in Milan. Um, again, librettists with the wonderful Illica and Giacosa. This time, Puccini turns to the Oriental, to the exotic, to the Oriental world. No, he watched, um, he watched the performance, well, when Tosca was premiered in London, at the, its London premiere, Puccini went. And there, he had a free time, and so he went to watch a play. He watched David Belasco's Madame Butterfly. That was, this was in 1900. And it reawakened his interest, in the, his interest in the exotic. So, the opera set in Nagasaki, Japan. It is a tragic story of a geisha, a 15-year-old geisha, Chocho-san, who marries Pinkerton, an American naval officer, who really just wanted to have an adventure while he was stationed in, in Japan. The naive Chocho-san, you know, when you're naive and you're simple, they call you butterfly, so that's why Madame Butterfly. The naive Chocho-san is smitten and falls in love with, with Pinkerton. And Pinkerton leaves, goes back to the U.S., and she remains faithful to him. Um, uh, even, when, even when people were, the, the, the American consul was already telling her, now forget about, about him, move on, to your, move on with your life, we'll marry somebody else. But she says, no, I'm loyal to him, I'm, I love him. Uh, but three years later, Pinkerton's ship docks into Nagasaki again, and she's very, very excited, but um, Pinkerton arrives with Kate, his American wife. And Pinkerton wants to take, now, Chocho son and Pinkerton has a young boy. They had a young boy, they have a young boy. And, and Pinkerton wanted to take the, young, the little boy back to them, to the US, and raise the boy with Kate. Chocho son, upon deciding to give, the, give up the child to him because the child will have a better life with him, he bids the she bids, bids the child goodbye and stops herself and kills herself. And certainly, the, the music is very, very dramatic. Now, um, does the story sound familiar? Miss Saigon, yeah. But Miss Saigon is set in Vietnam, but basically the same story, right? Um, uh, Oh, this one I have to mention, otherwise Dean Chua might uh, 
<laughs> might, might get disappointed. Now, Broadway, uh, Broadway composer um, Andrew Lloyd Webber is a big fan of Puccini. He found inspiration in Puccini's works and that he even wanted to compose um, a, a musical about the rivalry of Puccini and Leon Cavallo. Um, yeah, but uh, for some reason that musical did not push through. But the music for the music, the melody of probably his most famous song, Memory, um, was which was originally written for that Puccini Leon Cavallo musical. And um, but instead in, uh, again, it did not push through, so he used it for cats. And um, the melody, he really felt that the melody was a Puccinian, Puccinian style. Mom, can I hear the, just the melody? Yeah. It's um, it has a, a, a it has a sort of similar pattern. Um, it's not the same. It's not it's not the same, but it has a sort of a, a similar pattern as the melody of Un bel di vedremo. I'm gonna hear. Thank you, ma'am. So it's not the same, but it has sort of has that similar um, pattern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now let's move on. Fanciulla del Vest um, premiered on December 10, 1910, at the Metropolitan Metropolitan Opera. Uh, La Fanciulla del Vest was his first um, uh, for first foreign premiere, first foreign debut. Now, all his operas were premiered in, in Italy so far. Now, um, yeah, he performed it with Toscanini on the, as conductor and the soprano Emmy Destin and the great Enrico Caruso. Um, this one was also is also based on a David Belasco novel, David Belasco of the Madama Butterfly um, writer. And unfortunately, at this time, was it Giacosa already passed away? So he was in search of, of, of a librettist, a new librettist. And for this, the, the libretto was written by Guelfo Civinini and Carlo Zangarini. Zangarini. It is, um, at that time, about uh, 300 people from all over the world were flocking to California. You know, the gold rush, the gold rush, and they found gold in California, so everybody went there to look for gold. And um, it's the setting of this, uh, of this opera. So it is a love story between two gold seekers, um, yeah, uh, set during the California gold rush. Now, another melody uh, that inspired Andrew Lloyd Webber is a couple, a couple of bars towards the end of Act One of this opera. <laughs> Okay, what did that sound like to you? Yes? Music of the night. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like music of the night. <laughs> um, now, La Rondine, La Rondine, um, his eighth 
opera. This time, Puccini makes an attempt at operetta. Um, it was premiered in March 27, 1917, at the Grand Teatro de Monte Carlo. So another, another off uh, outside the outside the Italy uh, premiere, but. In Italy, it was premiered on uh, June 2, 1917, at the Teatro Comunale in Bologna. So, yeah. Uh, Italian this is an Italian libretto by Giuseppe Adami, based on a libretto by Alfred Maria Wilner and Heinz Reichert. So, operetta. It is the story of Magda, a courtesan, who finds true love with a young man from the country, but decides to leave him. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, that sounds also like, I don't know, what? Reminds us sort of um, uh, like Verdi's La Traviata. Not quite, but yeah. Now, it, yeah. In 1918, he had a triple bill of one act operas. So I think that's the one that you're uh, producing next year in March. So, uh, just the one. A two. Without the tabarro. Okay. <laughs> Usually they're, uh, yeah, distrittico are three short events of very different nature, drawing three different genre in one work. Now, a horror, a horror drama that takes place on a boat on the Seine River in Paris, Il Tabarro. And a sentimental tragedy that takes place, um, that's set in a convent, Suor Angelica. And a buffo, a comedy playful opera, Gianni Schicchi. Um, probably the most successful among the three uh, Operas, one act operas. No, um, it is the story of the, the story. Mm, the story of Gianni Schicchi is taken from an episode of Dante's Inferno, in Canto 30, uh, uh, 30th song, song 30 of Dante's Inferno, from the Divine Comedy. Yeah, um, probably familiar to us is the melody of O mio babbino caro. So she's going to play. Yeah. I think that's very familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was premiered on December 14, 1918 at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And um, yeah, it was the last premiere of his works that Puccini was going to attend. Um, yeah, after, after Il Trittico, you know, even before that, even before that, Puccini was very much aware of the avant-garde movement in music. No, he was, he knew of he was aware, he was sensitive to Debussy, Spelias, and Melisande in 1902, Richard Strauss, Sad in Creating these new resources, new styles into his work. No. Now, after Il Trittico, it took more than five years for Puccini to compose his last opera, Turandot. Um, oops, sorry. Turandot. But uh, in 1924, he had to go to Brussels no, to undergo a surgical operation. He had a, a tumor in his larynx. Um, the operation was successful, but five days later, 
he passed away, he died of a heart attack. Now, leaving Turandot unfinished. So, um, but the, the libretto, libretto by Giuseppe Adami and uh, Renato Simoni, based on a book by Carlo Gozzi. They wanted to push through with the premiere and show it, and Franco Alfano, one of, uh, one of Puccini's students, finished the unfinished parts of Turandot. It premiered on April 25, 1926, at Teatro alla Scala in Milan. But to everybody's surprise, Toscanini ended the opera at the point where Puccini finished it. So he did not play the Alfano ending. He said, um, qui finisce l'opera, rimasta in computa per la morte del maestro. Here, the opera ends and remains unfinished because of the death of the maestro. So, yeah. Um, if you, I don't know if you watched Turandot last, um, when was that? November, I think, December last year. Um, if you remember the scene after Liu, the servant girl, uh, died, and um, after the funeral, after the yeah, funeral march, that was where um, Puccini's music ends. Uh, and after that, towards the end, was already Alfano, the Alfano ending. Um, yeah, set in China, it tells the story of a princess, of Princess Turandot, who announces that he, she will marry the suitor who unravels three difficult riddles. If he fails, he will be beheaded. Now, Prince Kalaf uh, solves the riddles, but she refuses to give in to any foreigner. Why? Because she wanted to avenge the, the death of her ancestress, Princess Lo Ling, who was raped and murdered by a foreigner. Prince Kalaf, being a foreigner, she did not want to marry him. But uh, Kalaf challenged her, and she, he challenged her, guess what my name is, and if you can guess it, um, I, will, I will have myself beheaded. But if you fail to guess my name, you will have to marry me. Liu, the servant, uh, the servant of, of Kalaf's father, kills herself so as not to re reveal Kalaf's name. Anyway, it is Kalaf tells tells uh, Turandot that my name is Kalaf. But when uh, when the time came, Turandot announces that he was already falling in love with him. So in the end, she says um, his name is Love. His name is Amore. Love and happy ending. <laughs> Except for you. Now. Puccini always tried to achieve a perfect balance between music and, and, and stage action. In his works, every attitude, every feeling, um, every situation had to have an explicit motivation and a logical justification that is clear to the audience. Now, he carefully searched for his subjects uh, the subjects that touched the audience's interest. No, not just any subject that, is, that would please him, but something that would interest the audience. Um, and like Verdi before him, he imposed on his librettists, uh, he imposed on them dramaturgical solutions that best suited his musical needs. Um, he supervised he supervised personally the work of his lib librettists down to the smallest, smallest details. He suggested metrical adjustments, metrical solutions, and he requested changes and cuts in, in, in the text. For example, he tells Jacosa and Lilica, for this part, I want something that sounds like cocorico, cocorico bistecca. Cocorico, cocorico bistecca. And they go, 
Ah, cocorico, cocorico, bistecca. Quando men vo, quando men vo soletta. Yeah. So that's how he did it. He would give, he, he would give lines to them. And in fact, Lius Aria, tu che di gel sei cinta, music was written first before the, the text, you know, um, which was a, a reverse. Usually, usually it's the, the text first and then the music, but with Lius Aria and perhaps maybe other, other arias, other parts of his music, he created the music first to create a sonorous image of the subject. Now, um, later you will hear, uh, later during the performance, you will hear um, the music without its text. Okay, um, yeah. Puccini was an exceptionally refined musician, um, the most important Italian opera composer after Verdi. Now, in addition to a strong, melodic, and poetic literary gifts, Puccini possessed, um, um, as, as the ambassador already mentioned earlier, he possessed an extraordinary sense of theater. Now, he was a genius of theatrical drama. Um, they say he was the last of the great Italian composers, opera composers. Um, I am Rika Nepomuceno. Thank you for listening. And I close this part with a clip from A Day with Puccini. Uh, and um, we will be back after a few minutes um, for our short performance. Oh, before I forget, I think you have your... your um, your, your programs with you. There are changes in the program because um, one of our uh, singers, our baritone, um, uh, Lionel Guico, um, it cannot make it, he is sick. Um, so uh, we made adjustments. The first song will still be the same, Se come voi piccina io fossi, le villi. The second song will be Quando Men Vo from La Boheme. Third song will be Sole, Sole e Amore. Fourth song, Don Delieta Wushi from La Boheme. Straight to the Boheme Quartet of Act Three. And then Vissi d'Arte, the Humming Chorus from Madama. And then Firenze uh, from Gianni Schicchi. And then the ninth song is Tu che di gel sei cinta, with piano solo, and Nessun dorma from Turandot. Uh, yeah, and then um, after the, 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 the very, very short clip of Puccini, uh, from the A Day, A Day with Puccini, um, we will have an intermission and we will just keep playing some some videos, some video clips of, of movies, again, of movies that, um, uh, that featured Puccini's music. You may, we're just going to leave it on and you may go, I don't know, uh, for, a, for a CR break or a, I don't know, a smoke break, busy <laughs> break. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope I was able to give a, a, a more or less um, a substantial overview, an introduction, and yeah, um, and hopefully, hopefully, you come and watch the operas that um, that are going to be presented in the next and then in the next few months and in the years to come. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it's okay.
There will be a 15 minute intermission. There will be a 15 minute intermission. Thank you.